My name is Terangi, but um, I usually go by my middle name, Ben, and I'm going to talk to you guys about CI CD pipelines. Oh. Huh. Yeah, so who am I? Um, I'm a New Zealander, so if you're wondering where my name comes from and why I pronounce all my words better than you guys, <laughs> <laughs> that'll be why. Um, but yeah, so I've been in the industry, the software development industry, for about 15 years now. Um, working across quite a broad spectrum. I started my career with small startups, I just started on my own originally, and then went to other little companies, um, worked with some of them, and then switched over to banking, which was quite a, quite a change. Um, but throughout that cycle, I've kind of been coming into the banking with the view and with projects of trying to switch teams into running like it's a small company, trying to make them independent and autonomous away from the rest of the complex organisations at banks. Um, I've also worked across quite a few different roles, so I'm a generalist, I've worked in um, development, worked in infrastructure, I've done networking, but overall the main thing I've really done has been working in test with dev teams to try and set up quality assurance practices for that team. What else do we want to mention here? Um, yeah, oh yes, so I am working at NAB at the moment and working across a few areas. The current team I'm in is the, um, what are we called, quality engineering. So I'm working in the innovation space, trying to get some new tools and shake things up a bit. If you want to get in touch with me, there's a couple of QR codes on the screen now. I'm available on Freenode IRC and on LinkedIn. Just due warning, I typically take a while to respond to stuff, so if you just fire up a message, it might be a couple of days before I do anything, but I will have a look. Um, a few people have done the raise your hand stuff, and it's a bit late in the day, so I'm actually going to go the extra mile and get every single person to stand up to now. Thank you. Cool. So I'm pretty sure that you're all here to learn about testing, unless you were looking for like a wine shareholders AGM, <laughs> in which case you're in the wrong space. But so we're all testers in some shape or form. But I'm interested to know who is a tester and who is something else for their core competency. So if you are no. No, oh. it's a black screen. Oh, there we go, something. Okay, so if you are a tester, sit down. If that's the main thing that you do. Cool. Yeah, so the main thing you do is testing. That's cool, so that's a massive portion of the audience today. How about programmers? If the main thing you do is programming for your team, Sit down. Cool. Anybody here an uh, infrastructure engineer? Doing infrastructure as code, in networking? Some people maybe? Whoa. Reliability engineers. Anybody got that title? Nope. What's the difference between reliability and quality? Maybe another talk. Um, business analysts. Cool. Others. So, who are you guys? <laughs> cool. Right, so I might come back to that in a bit, but yeah, it is kind of an interesting note that we're learning about testing. Um, most people are testers, so it's Possibly not that interesting as it comes, but maybe we'll get to that. Um, so when Cam and organisers reached out and asked me to talk about this sort of channel of stuff, I really did want to talk about DevOps in this space because for the first half of this year I was working for NAB Cloud Guild. It's a really cool um, project or endeavour that NAB's on is to get everyone trained up to work with cloud technology. So I've been part of that guild, pretty small team, training people across the entire technology part of the organisation 
into what cloud is and how you can work with AWS, Azure, that sort of stuff. And I did find that a lot of the people that came to those courses that we were running weren't testers, even though they are in those teams. Um, and often the feedback from managers and the testers themselves was they didn't think they needed to know about that technology. Which is a bit worrying. Um, Part of that as well is I went to quite a few DevOps focused conferences, Container Camp, some of the other ones, AWS Summit, and there was not a lot of testers at those meetings either. I'm kind of, and it may be jaded, maybe I'm wrong, but it looks like testers are missing out on what is quite a big revolution in the industry. And it's, it's got me a little bit worried, partly because you're all awesome and I like you, I want you to be around. Um, partly also because our skill set is really needed. The observations I've had, and they're just anecdotal, but from what I've seen as the industry shifts into the space, we've moved a lot of people who are network engineers who were doing Linux administration or system administration, and they've learnt Python, and they've gone into quite senior programming roles. But they've missed the last couple of decades worth of good programming practices. So they haven't bought TDD with them, they haven't bought a lot of the testing stuff that other people did learn. So I kind of want to talk about this because I think more people need to get involved in the space and need to kind of get across these fundamentals and work, about, work out how we can contribute and shape the world this year. Right, so what am I talking about here? DevOps is a buzzword for a key trend. I say that because a lot of our organisations have probably implemented something with that label that doesn't actually align to what the original people who keep deploying those phrases were actually talking about. Um, what I'm going to summarise DevOps as here is the alignment of development and operations. So if you've seen the worst case scenarios where you've actually got people in development, they're just part of projects, they spin up, make some software, ship it out, they've got no responsibility after it's been pushed out, and it doesn't matter if it breaks constantly or not, they get promoted and they move on. Um, and on the other side, operations are assessed on KPIs of keeping stuff stable, so they don't want stuff to change. And you get these competing business goals. Um, another thing I wanted to mention here is that DevOps from the start has implicitly always included test. The other terms like design, dev, set, test, busy, ops just isn't as punchy. So we've always wanted testing to be included in the space. And I think, in my view, it was part of the amalgamation at that extreme programming age. And it was also kind of included in Agile. Most of the people in that room, when they came up with the manifesto, oh, a bunch of them were testers and test-focused people. Um, so it's always been there. It isn't supposed to exclude us. It's just part of the dev as part of that group was considering. Um, the revolution that we're seeing is that part of it is challenging teams to work cross-functionally, either as cross-functional teams or as cross-functional individuals. And testing is definitely getting wound up into that. For teams that are getting quite mature in this space, CI CD pipelines, which is what I'm going to talk about in more detail soon, are uh, the, what I consider the automated SDLCs for those teams. So they're the systems that used to go through that single cycle. We just pulled it out and now we made it look like an infinity figure eight sign, but it basically could be unwound into a spire as well. So what is that? CI CD. So, Continuous integration is the first portion of that, and that's the key part. You can't really go to get onto your CD side of things until you've really got CI started. CI for testers is, in my view, um, for tests that validate if the application will work. Once you get to the CD space, that's when you're doing more of your implemented tests and you're actually checking if your application is working. I'll talk about what that means soon. Uh, yeah, so yeah, starting with CI. This is an example of a what typically might be in your CI pipeline. You'll start that system with a code change, 
And inside that pipeline, you'll run through a number of automated checks. I don't know why one's coloured different colour. I think that was a mistake. <laughs> my, um, but, yeah, so typically what you might start with is dependency checks, things like CVEs, lookups to see if your systems have any bugs or security issues known on the World Wide Web. Um, run your unit tests across that code base. Do style checks and linting. You might also do secure, static security scans, so SARS checks, looking for if someone in the code, someone that's edited the code, has put some, um, you know, string connectation to build SQL queries or some other bad smells that they can just look at the code and detect these things. After that, you'll compile your code or assemble whatever thing that you're working with. Once you've got your application out of that, you can run your black box tests, application load or performance tests, contract tests, anything else that requires the application to be up and available to use. After that stage, you'll typically do a deployment. So it looks like everything's okay. You'll put it onto one of your staging systems and run integration tests or some technical verification tests like that and spec stuff. If all of that has gone all right, after that your CI system can stamp that build as, yep, everything's good and it's okay to move ahead. If at any stage your tests fail or meet some line that marks it as not acceptable, they should fall out and it'll just be not marked as not good enough. So this should run across all your builds, any code changes should run through these series of steps. Um, so some of the feedback I do get from people who are new to this is um, that looks a lot like what I do, is this replacing me? And I think it shouldn't be. The, it's another series in automation, it's basically just an extended um, so this is part of your automation suite where everything's all plugged in together. Uh, we still need talented people who know test, who know what to target, who know how to test an application to design all those checks to be built into the pipeline. They're not a replacement for testers, but I would express some caution for people in the career that it does look like we're shifting away from people who might be considering themselves to be manual or non-technical testers without looking at automation space. There could still be roles there, but what I'm seeing is a lot of um, vendors. At NAB we work with heaps of different vendors, and some of them now just don't hire testers. They come to us, I ask them for some squad teams um, full of people, and they can provide a few roles, but they just don't have any testers on their books. Um, so we're looking at a space where programmers with testing skills or testers with programming skills are what, they're, what we're sort of looking for in the industry. And I think touching on some of the points that the panel introduced, the interesting thing is we're at a testing conference. Everyone that's really coming along is testers. We're asking developers to get into this space too, but there's a distinct lack of developers showing a lot of interest in learning the core concepts of testing. So, to start with that on a bit of doom and gloom, I guess, but I'm a tester, I think cynical. Um, I wanted to talk through some of the stuff that people, I think, should know about the technology we use for pipelines. Um, a key part of this is SCM, so Git or Subversion, any of those tools that people have used before. This is basically a mechanism for tracking changes to your code base. Um, <coughs> Most people are going to be aware of this. <coughs> Good. Um, for anyone who's not for some reason, it's quite a simple tool. Really, it gets extremely complicated, but at low level it's quite simple. If you think of control Z to undo, that's moving back a revision. Control Y to move forward, that's moving forward a revision. Those tools like Git and stuff can track those incrementally over time, and you can see which version is working because it's past your CI pipeline, and which version is not working because it hasn't passed it. Um, simple example up here, that there's a little application. All it does is write, hello, testing talks five times onto your screen. Or it was supposed to. The first version has a bug in it. So the version two is a bug fix. Someone corrected the word hello. And then after that, someone added a cool new feature. They put an underline underneath the thing and sort of centered the text around it. Every single change to your code repository should be processed through the pipeline. Cool. 
Um, and there's a number of ways to do that. So you should make sure that this is an automated trigger that starts your pipeline. You shouldn't try and do this manually. If you still log into Jenkins or your box or something and run the pipeline, that should be something you start addressing. So it's quite a simple thing and it just means that all of this can happen in the background and you can get a lot more peace of mind. Um, run your application through that, um, don't rely on Okay, I've said that. So there's two typical ways you can do this. The first of them will be to start with um, webhooks. If your system can talk to your build machine, this is the best way. So example up on the screen here has GitHub. In that case you can specify the URL to hit. Every time you push a change to GitHub, it'll send a message to that build machine and say, I'm re I've made a change, please verify that this is good. This is the best way to do it because you're only doing one network call every time you make a change. And your, yeah, if your ECM can access the build machine, it's um, the most efficient option. If you don't have that access, um, less efficient options are to poll your change your source control from your pipeline. So this pipeline can query every period or so, check if there has been code changes and run the pipeline if there are. This does mean there is a bit of a lag, potentially, with your system, and it can mean there's a lot of unnecessary web traffic or net traffic if, if you've got a lot of these systems all talking to your SCM. But it can be useful if your um, source control is firewalled and locked away from the compute that you're using to do your builds. So that's the starting point. On that pipeline view, this is how we should kick off every build, and we should do it on every single change. So back onto the source control again. There's another feature that source control can do, which is branching. And I've noticed a trend for teams who are picking this up to go kind of a bit overhaul with this, and start using what's commonly known as git flow. And this you've got three major long-lived branches. You've got your master branch, you've got your develop branch, and you've got some release branch, which could just be created as needed, but usually these three run long-lived. And then you might have version branches as well, which can be quite a pain. Um, in, my, in my experience, this is unnecessary if you're starting with the Greenfields project. If you're starting with something new, this over-engineers it, and you're introducing delayed integration into your process. If you've got a big complex system where you've got nine-hour build system, nine hours of tests, then you actually kind of need to have some of this stuff, but you put it in and then try and refactor it out later. What is a much more elegant strategy is um, what's commonly called GitHub flow. In this case, you've got a single core branch, all your changes are done on feature branches. So you've got a bug fix, you can diverge from your master branch, do your bug fix change on there, do your testing on that same branch, verify that it's up to date, pull in any changes that might have happened in the master branch, verify still on your feature branch, and then when you know you're up to date and you've got everything, merge it back into the core branch at that stage. So it keeps things much simpler and allows you to um, have a lot less extra testing efforts. Plus it means you're always somewhat confident because every change that has gone into your core branch has been verified by your pipeline. Yeah, okay, so i pass that one. Um, another thing that I wanted to talk about here, and this again also came up at the um, panel, um, my view on where we should be differentiating between automation and not automation is along the progression and regression lines. So I see progression as requiring quite a lot of one-off extra tests. Once you're adding a new feature, you'll want to do a lot more investigation into that particular change. Part of that change is going to involve exploratory testing. Um, due diligence checks, like when you're looking at your programmer's tests, reviewing that the unit tests are there, and checking that any of the other required checks that you need to do have been done. Um, it would also involve building those automated tests that will become part of your regression suite. So what I'm proposing is that every regression test, every function that you've built into your product already, should be maintained with automated tests. 
And you should do that with some structured pattern like BDD or ATDD or um, anything else like that. It really shouldn't be an extensive check because you've done your thorough investigations in exploratory mode. And if you're updating a significant amount of code, you might do a bit more as part of your progression. But for the most part, all those regression checks need to do is prove that something you've already built has not regressed. The Beyonce rule has become a bit of an industry term for that coverage. If your business or your customers have paid you to build something, you need to be confident that it is always maintained. If you don't have automation, if you require someone to manually do it, manually verify that that feature is maintained for eternity, then things are going to get flaky. Someone most likely skip it, or you'll end up with so much manual testing that you just can't keep up with the pace that your customers need you to do. So it's worthwhile investing in that extra effort, making sure that test is part of the build. Um, yeah, so like the song doesn't go, if you like it, then you should have put a test on it. Badly designed test suites are the worst thing for CI pipelines. If you have an extensive set of tests that takes far too long to run, then you really need to fix that before you start working on any other parts because that's not the bottleneck in your process. The bottleneck in your process is going to be um, those flaky tests, tests that run too long, and it's a, usually an indication that you need to start reviewing how those tests are designed and where those tests are being focused. So we've already looked at the test automation pyramid today. Now, I quite like this view just because every single test strategy I've come across has the test automation pyramid in it, but then I go and look at the code and it doesn't necessarily reflect what the team's goals are. So to reduce that, target your tests at the right level. Um, in this simple example here, we've got an email validator class. So it's a function or a piece of unit inside your code that validates if an email is correct. You can push all the, single di all the data permutations and testers in the room will definitely be able to think of some other ones that, that other than the ones I've mentioned. But think of all the different things that it needs to validate as true or false and push them against that unit. When you get to your interface tests, through your GUI, through your REST API, you don't have to test every permutation. That's going to result in a flaky, complex test suite um, and one that is probably going to take quite a long time to run. All you actually need to validate at that stage is if your validator unit is being called by that interface. Um, so you can just pass in a good one and a bad one and make sure that the module is being accessed. You know the app module works, so you don't need to exercise it again because you can see at the unit level that's being done. Collaborate with the rest of your teams to get that coverage. Don't go over the fence. Don't try and put all your testing as a black box coverage. Understand what's been done earlier and try and leverage that to make your tests efficient. So that's regression testing and how we can really optimise that. The other side of things is progression testing. And I wanted to talk about how that might fit into your pipelines. So progression testing, like I defined in my view, does include a lot of stuff that are kind of manual tests, one-off tests. Um, those don't have a lot of time in the pipeline to run it. You don't want to start your pipeline, then stop to a manual stage and go, OK, tester A, now go write all your manual tests and click the next button. You can do that for a while and it might help you shake out what your pipeline is, but overall you want to try and build those into the earlier parts of your build process itself along with coding. So you don't really have time for that during the manual ex for the execution time. You still need to do it. You still need to do the investigation. You still need to review your programmer's unit tests. Um, uh, yeah, okay, so what I'm suggesting here is just one possible trick that people can use is to establish those stage gates into some of your tracking tools. Um, and, and then use automation just to track that some of those stage gates have been delivered on. Bit of a walk through that might, might click into. So one possible option, and this is just, um, just a possible implementation, I'm not necessarily saying you should definitely use these exact tools or this exact process, 
but something along these lines could work for many, many people if you have this problem. So you can associate your changes with the tracking system. There's a number of ways you can do this. There are tools that align Git with um, your JIRA tickets, for example, or something else. But I found a really easy way is just to put the story code into your Git branch name. So illustration down here, there's a Git checkout command where we're making a new feature branch with the name of this um, story in it. In this case, it's some cool feature where some application is going to get more cats. After that, establish a convention with your team. You can, as long as it's agreed on, it doesn't really have to be anything like this. This is one possible option. So in this case, I'm proposing a pattern where your team have all agreed that the label unit testing confirmed is going to be the sign off point saying, yes, I've definitely done this. Um, the story has had the unit testing confirmed on it because that's one of our manual stage gates that we want done on every single change in our process. So after the test has done that change, they can go into JIRA, they can apply that label, and that way there's a sign on the audit history saying, tester Ben, put unit testing confirmed on there. It's auditable, it shows that somebody did it, and if it was done by someone who wasn't supposed to do that, then you can kind of find out who did it, who and why. Um, once that's on there, you get visibility on your Jira ticket, so that's quite useful. After that, inside your pipeline, you can use the Jira API. So I chose Jira because it's an API that I'm quite familiar with, but any of these tools, or many of these tools, can probably do this. How's, how's QTest, does it have an API? Maybe. Um, any of these tools may have some options. Um, worst case scenario, you can call the HTML interface and you can just scrape that. Um, but yeah, in this case, called the Jira API with uh, illustration here as Postman, but you can call it with curl or whatever you want, and it returns some JSON. Inside that JSON, there's a label saying unit testing confirmed. So your pipeline can automatically say, oh, yes, that looks good then. Yep. So here's an example of a pretty simple stage for like a Jenkins pipeline. Um, so Jira Helper, get the labels, if it includes mandatory tags, then print, that's okay. Otherwise, say no and why, and then drop out to a failure. So this means that you can build some of those manual requirements in. You don't have to just leave them as um, background requirements that could possibly get lost because someone fast-tracked their story through and just merged it straight into prod. You can um, code that in and you can also give visibility as to, hey, no, you can't merge this because you need someone else in your team to peer review your code, that kind of thing. That's one way of doing it. There's other ways. Um, some systems actually allow this type of tight integration. GitLab is pretty cool. It actually builds that tracking with your SCM and everything can talk to each other, so you need to do less of these REST-based integrations, but they're all kind of options if you want to spin it yourself. So that was CI. Um, hopefully people have got a bit of a view around the stuff we can do there, and what, we, what I'm proposing at least should be involved in a CI pipeline. At the end of that, you've staged your code, you've run your static tests across it, you've run your black box tests across it, and you're pretty confident this is going to work. This is where you're ready to go into your um, CD process. So this is your delivery into production. Inside this side of things, you're going to have a number of different other tests. There's a few tests that you can't really do in your staging environment. So what is a typical flow on this type of, um, this type of pipeline? Take that verified change from your CI system and then push it into some dormant environment. Um, this could be a Docker node um, in your Kubernetes cluster. It could just be some virtualization. Maybe it's on-prem. Maybe you've just yeah, isolated one of your data centers, deployed new code into there, make sure no public customer traffic is hitting that particular system. Then with that dormant <coughs> environment, you can start running those production or those production readiness checks. So health checks on your APIs, call it and see if it um, says you're some healthy. You can also do things like deep health checks. 
So these are things we've played around with, but it has been a bit tricky. The model here was to do stuff like health checks often will be used by load balancers and stuff. So your load balancer wants to get a very quick response saying, yep, I'm up and I'm running. Um, otherwise, it'll redirect traffic to some other parts of your computing network. Deep health checks can go into the areas that a typical health check couldn't do. So it might go into something that takes a long time to respond. Um, it could do some other checks that you might not want to knock it off the load balancer. Maybe you're getting a partial response from some of your downward providers. Uh, and you still want to be available because you don't want to redirect your traffic if that happens. Um, yeah, that's something you can do there. Uh, you can also do certificate checks because uh, a number of people have worked in a high security domain where you're working on mutual authentication systems. When you go into those environments, your system has to have firewall access to the other nodes that it talks to. It has to have the right certificates to talk to those other systems. It has to know what those other systems certificates are in order to accept responses and requests from those ones too. So you can start scanning through those checks with some automated tests in your dormant environment. You can also look at configuration checks and again you can run some of those TVT and inspect sort of things that was being talked about earlier. At that point your system should look, if it's passed all those checks, it should look like it's ready to go. So at that stage you can start doing some sort of scaled deployment. Um, best case scenario. Uh, which could be something like canary or blue-green deployments. So, I'm looking for time. Yeah, not too bad. Um, so blue-green's a pretty typical one. You've got two systems. Um, you might have them both online during normal traffic, but for the production deployments, you just take one offline, put this dormant environment on it and verify it. Then you can start directing traffic to your updated module, making sure that that one is working. Your production is not spiking or causing any new errors. And then, if that's okay, you can do the same deployment across your other node and start deploying there, and then redirecting traffic across your whole um, suite once more. Canary is the same prospect, so, same concept, sorry. If we think about a ride sharing company where you want to deploy some updates to your back end systems, but you're a little bit cautious that maybe these changes are going to affect your systems. You can use Canary to scale that deployment in a very gradual phase. So you could <coughs> use a number of processes. Um, you might, in that case, want to use something geospatial. So you might say, OK, I'll deploy this, and but I'll only make the updated nodes available to the part of the world that is at 3 AM in the morning and something. So you just want to make sure that only a very small section of your user base is going to be hitting that updated. Um, updated mode nodes. Um, otherwise you could just do it on <coughs> load balancing and you could just say a raw 1% of the traffic should go to the updated systems. As that works you can scale that out to more nodes or you can redirect your canary load balancer to hit more of those systems until gradually you've seen it deploy across your whole network. Um, the advantage with that is if you do have issues, you can do that rollback. You can identify that suddenly errors are spiking. We don't want it to hit everybody, so we can pull it back a bit. Um, and yeah, the last phase of that kind of couples closely with that, where you've got monitoring to track how that deployment's performing in your production environment. The monitoring could also be used quite extensively post, um, post the deployment. So if we're thinking of design tests, you might be doing A-B testing where you've delivered four different features to your customers and you just want to check that it's all, um, which customers had the best experience or utilised the product in the best way that you could, that you wanted. At the end of that, everything looks peachy, so yay. Otherwise, automate that rollback, either if you're on nice new cloudy infrastructure, you basically just shut down all the updated nodes and then redirect traffic back to your other ones. Otherwise, no. So that's a typical view of a CD pipeline, which can pick up stuff after CI. Some tricks I'd suggest um, kind of being aware of, or some 
ways of thinking to be aware of when you're working in this space is to start thinking of deployments and releases as two separate things. You're, if you're releasing quite occasionally, then those are probably the same thing. You're only going to be doing deployments once a week. You're probably getting new features out to customers once a week. You want to break those apart because if you're deploying hundreds of times a day, you don't want that to make an impact on your customers every single time you do that. So you want to pull out some of that requirements and only control actual new features going to them or changes affecting their UI if you, on particular, less often occasions. Um, ways you can do that, feature toggles is a really good way of controlling that. So if you're doing those regular deployments, encapsulate your code, um, encapsulate your new features inside configuration-based toggles. So if you have a awesome new feature coming in, but it's not quite ready for your users to start using it, put a feature toggle around that and protect it. One area where you might be careful with this is if your toggles are on the client side, if you're delivering updated code to your users, excuse me, uh, to your users on the client, um, but you don't want them to know what those awesome new features are, then this can be a bit of a hazard because putting this on to that client code and then delivering it to them, there's a number of people out in the wild that will find that updated code and they will start um, playing around with it, releasing press notifications and leaks and stuff. Um, another suggestion I'd also have for test audience is make sure you clean away all that code when you're actually releasing that feature. Don't just turn the toggle on because that's going to involve quite a lot of unnecessary complex logic inside your application. So rip that out and just have the feature on. Also suggest testing with those toggles on plus the desired feature state. So that will allow you to verify what you're targeting plus if you're going to have conflicts between some of those toggles when they all do get enabled. That's it. Thanks. Uh, so any questions before I give out a thing? I think we've only got time for one. All right, okay. cool. Uh, I have one question. Mm. Okay. It is about like, uh, while uh, we were discussing about the pipeline, these are the things we need to do. Uh, we talked about load testing as well. So my question is like, if we are doing some cosmetic things in our code, so uh, cosmetic things that I need to say any uh, changes in the UI, so in those scenarios, the like, should we consider all the stuff, like uh, doing all the type of testing, load testing, or... Cool. So the question is, if we're, t if we're making cosmetic changes to a UI, should we run an extensive set of exactly. full changes across the application? Um, ideally, if you've got an efficient enough test suite, it just shouldn't matter. It should be easy enough to run the whole suite across it, that it's easier just to do that than to try and tailor it down to those changes. If you don't have something that is so optimized, then maybe you do. Maybe. Um, it depends, which is, sorry, a cheat answer. Uh, but you can also, I'd also suggest that if you have just that level there, try and isolate that into a smaller portion of code. That way your changes are only testing the part that's actually relevant to that, and you don't have to test your whole stack. Okay.